Hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 11 game main slate we have here on Tuesday, June 20. Uh, looks like we've got everybody pretty much sorted on the mound here so far. Uh, maybe a shenanigan here or there with Oakland, depending on what they want to do opener wise. Um, it looks like, I mean, MLB still has Medina as the starter, but it looks like they're probably going to have Waldachuk open and then Medina come in afterwards. So that's uh, that really looks like um, maybe the only question mark that we've got so far. Everybody announced, everybody ready to go, it seems. We do get Seth Lugo back here tonight for the Padres. He's been on the deal with a calf um, for a little while. So everybody else looks ready to, ready to rock. So uh, projections-wise, we've got everything loaded to the site. Same thing with ownership. Um, keep an eye out for changes, of course, all throughout the day. Overall, I think we can get pretty spread out here today. Don't think we necessarily have to eat 35% ownership on a guy. We'll get to that in our first game here. Um, but for the most part, pretty spread out um, all over the place. I think there's some interesting tournament arms that we can get to. And, you know, a lot of these guys have upside. Some bad matchups. You know, Mackenzie Gore with upside, bad matchup, right? Kirby, a little bit of upside, not the greatest matchup. Um, you know, Bailey Ober, a little bit of upside, not the greatest matchup. This kind of stuff, you know, Nathan all is expensive. Um, you know, so we, as as usual, just got to kind of make some decisions here and see where we can squeeze out a little bit of value. Uh, some pretty popular spots in the batter's box, of course. Cleveland against Oakland. They're going to be very popular, uh, but perhaps some maybe under the radar spots as well. At least uh, as ownership is suggesting here in early runs. So let's uh, let's just get into it and go over Seattle and the Yankees right off the bat. We got George Kirby at 8,700 and Garrett Cole on the other side. Um, now Kirby here only seen about you know, 10, 12% ownership on him right now. Projection's really strong. Value source strong. Pushing 30 here. I like this. I think this is fine at 8,700 here. Still missing Judge, of course, are the Yankees. And overall, the offense is uh, not very good, right? Um, 22, 23% carry. It's about average. 95 WRC plus. Below average. Hit for power, right? But that's coming down because really this is the only thing that this team does. And missing Judge... They're missing an aggregate 300 ISO, which is going to tank this figure overall. You know, 33% hard contact, buck 10, ground ball to fly ball, ground ball to fly ball or so, but pretty average outside of the kind of, you know, slightly elevated ISO figure here. Um, you know, they do have Stanton and, and Donaldson back who will hit the ball over the wall. Anthony Rizzo, historically, of course, I mean, this is a Yankee stadium, right? But all he does is hit the ball over the wall anymore and, and walk. Doesn't hit for any average. He's been slumping terribly recently also. Really their best hitter all season outside of Judge is Ben Glaber Torres. He's at 56. He's kind of stiff here. And I don't really want to do that against George Kirby. His numbers against righties are pretty damn excellent, right? 243 average allowed, 265 Woba with a 106 ISO and a 24% K rate. It's a tick or even two ticks above average against the right side of the plate, where he's a little bit more susceptible and what drags the strikeout rate down for Kirby is against the lefties, right? 19% strikeout rate with a 273 average allowed. So pitching to a good bit more contact, a little bit more power as well, but nothing too horrible here at a 161. Expected metrics, 259 XBA, 292 X Woba, two pretty okay numbers there with a 139 x iso very good number there hard contact numbers are great really really good against the right side at with a soft contact of 23 and a half percent hard contact though south of 30 to both sides got get some ground balls buck 30 in aggregate ground ball to fly ball and he doesn't walk anybody anybody ever elite walk right here at sub two percent the question mark that we have is that he throws so many strikes. And we talked about this several times here with Kirby. He's so in the strike zone that when he pitches to a lot of contact, full 82% here, that can get him beat up a little bit sometimes. Um, now, we generally still like guys that can throw it past a lot of these Yankees here. And 
it's going to kind of depend on the Yankee lineup and how they roll it out tonight. They're going to have, you know, what, six, maybe even seven righties in there tonight, depending on what they want to do um, in the outfield. If that's the case, if they got seven righties in here tonight, I'm, I'm going to get pretty high on George Kirby, I think, especially considering the ownership. It's it's unlikely to change all that much throughout the day, at least for Kirby. Um, so if that's the case with the excess righties in the lineup from the Yankees, uh, I would like to get onto a, a good bit of Kirby. However, they might throw three or even four lefties in there. They do have them. Right, they've got a Willie Calhoun, they got a Jake Bowers, Anthony Rizzo, Billy McKinney, these types. If they do throw out four or even five lefties, if they can make that happen, um, then that would kind of take me off of Kirby a little bit more. But overall, eighty-seven hundred, I think this is a fine price tag for him. I've, I think he's got a little bit of hidden upside that's not priced in, and I think he can pop for twenty-five and and a little bit north of that on occasion here. Um, you know, we do need him for targeting 160 points or whatever and, and tournaments on DK, you know, we do need him to pop for 28. I think that's kind of unlikely, but it's very well within range because he throws so many strikes. 71% strike one rate is fantastic. He's got elite chase. It's just that he doesn't induce a hell of a lot of swinging strikes because he's so in the strike zone. So that's really the only question mark with him. Uh, but everything else is fantastic. He's a really, really good arm, and he's got upside in this matchup because the Yankees are kind of bad. Garrett Cole on the mound for them, 10-9. I think he's overpriced, and I talked about this in his last start. Like, where is all the upside for Garrett Cole? The strikeout stuff is down six and seven ticks um, you know, to previous seasons. He's fixed kind of the homer problem, but he's popped for 25 points, what, four, five times this season? Um and outside of that, he's been hovering at 20 or even below. I don't know. I think his numbers are mostly just average. I'm still looking for more regression to come in the suppression. 275 ERA with a 385 XFIP, 81% strain rate. It's not sustainable long term. And as we get a larger and larger sample, it's going to continue to drift downward. Right? Walk rate is up a little bit at 8%. It's not horrible, but it is up for Garrett Cole. Barrel rate. Still at a, a pretty healthy 9%. These are average numbers. He's only got an aggregate 26% strikeout rate this season. Yeah, he doesn't give up a lot of power. He seemed to have solved the homer problem that he has exhibited in the you know past several years. He's gotten that under control, but he, as we've mentioned before, he's sacrificing strikeout stuff. He's still a little bit susceptible to giving up some fly balls, and this is still at Yankee Stadium, right, with the four-seamer slider mix. Those are really his two equitable pitches, right? There's no value on the change and there's no value on the curveball here. So that's going to keep him kind of up and elevated in the strike zone. And even against Seattle, yeah, they're like, don't, let's not get it confused here. This is a good matchup for him. 26% K rate against righties for Seattle. They're a bad offense too. Just break even here. Average power, average hard contact, neutral ground ball to fly ball. They'll walk a little bit and put some guys on base, but they still don't create. And that puts Garrett Cole squarely in play, certainly. But at 35% ownership, I, I mean, I know what the projection says. Uh, I'd rather come off of that at this particular price tag. I think he's overpriced in general for the upside that he's displaying this season. He can pop for 40 anytime he walks out there because it's still in there for him. But on an on a median basis, he just hasn't displayed it at all this season. And it's not like he's had a lot of really super difficult matchups. I mean, he's had some, let's not get it confused, right? He's had Texas, he's had Cleveland, he's had Tampa twice, right? Toronto doesn't strike out. San Diego's a pretty good offense. Baltimore, pretty good offense. You know, so he's he's had lower strikeout um, opponents here, and that has certainly contributed to the drop in his numbers this year. In, in the good matchups, he certainly excelled, right? San Francisco, Minnesota, teams that strike out, pops for some pretty good numbers. And those are his two best performances of the season. Could that could we see that and, you know, look back on this tomorrow and be like, oh, yeah, well, it's Seattle. They strike out a lot, right? It's fine to have seen Garrett Cole pop for a big number. Yeah, I think that's an okay assumption. 
because he's still throwing a lot of strike one. He still has 30% chase. That's fine. But the swing strike rate's down a few ticks here. He's only at a 28% CSW. So overall, I think he's overpriced for 35% ownership on a full 11 game slate when there's plenty of other arms that we can get to. Um, so if I had to build teams right now, I'd, I'd definitely come in under this figure and I'd certainly have some Seattle stacks on the other side as a little bit of coverage. Um, I don't think it's all that probable that he gets just super blown apart here. The most runs, you know, most production he's given up all season uh, was five. He did that twice one or three times. Once against San Diego, once against Baltimore, and then once against Tampa. Uh, for the most part, he is still an above-average arm. But relative to a lot of the other guys on the slate, like in terms of raw upside at this particular price tag, this is like fifth highest strikeout rate on the day. There are other guys around here, cheaper guys, one a little bit more expensive who we'll get to in a little while, uh, one a little bit less expensive, who we'll get to at the end, that are, I, th I think are better plays. A couple of guys are a little bit less expensive that I think are probably better plays overall than eating 35% ownership. It's mostly the combination of the price tag and the ownership that keeps me off um, getting outsized proportions and exposures of Garrett Cole here. But, you know, it's not like he's a bad play necessarily. Uh, but I do think... This is going to, um, you know, really constrain us to some similar builds, especially if we want to play a team like Cleveland. Chalk build today is going to be Garrett Cole with a Cleveland stack, something like, or a, or a Cincinnati stack, something like that. Um, and getting a lot of Garrett Cole is probably not where I want to land in tournaments on a full 11 game slate. So I'll come in under almost definitely and just get to some other guys. But it, I think having exposure and having a little bit of coverage here with Garrett Cole is certainly warranted because Seattle could very well shit the bed. Even though their offense has been a little bit better recently, they're still not all that great. So overall, uh, pretty much off of offense and it, it's mostly pitching here. Um, but I'm going to have a couple of, you know, coverage Seattle stacks just in case Garrett Cole is bad, but it's mostly leverage because 35% ownership, I think is a bit too high. Okay. Let's move on. Cubs and, and the uh, Pirates. Stroman on the mound, I think he's a little bit overpriced here, too. Um, I, I like playing Stroman, and I really like playing him at very low ownership here. We're only getting him at 5% right now. I think this is fine in tournaments. Um, I'm, I'm concerned with upside. I, I do think he is a little bit overpriced, given that he's only got the 21.5% Ks in the tank. We want the opposing offenses to go really right-handed heavy against Stroman because the strikeout rate is higher and despite a slightly lower ground ball rate to the right side compared to the left side, right, 240 ground ball to fly ball to righties, 340 to the lefties, I mean, it's still well over two. So we don't really care about that all that much. Hard contact numbers are excellent. So how we really want, you know, to get outsized exposures with Strom and try to get a lot of leverage on the field is when the opposing offense is going to go very right-handed heavy. That's probably not the case here tonight. They'll be pretty evenly split. G1 Bay, they've been leading off against righties recently. Brian Reynolds still, of course, from both, by, both sides at the top of the lineup. They'll have Kutch in there. They'll have um, Cabrian Hayes in there, most likely. And their high upside catcher piece, Henry Davis, probably have in there as well. Um, or either one of the other catchers, who knows what they're going to do, but they're going to be pretty balanced because from the left side, Jiwon Bay, Reynolds, Santana, Jack Sawinski, maybe a Tuki Marcano or something down at the bottom of the list. That's how they're going to balance here. Um, so strikeout wise, those guys are going to strike out a little bit less. And that would kind of take me off of Stroman. That's why I think his upside is a bit capped at this particular price tag. But fundamentally, there's really nothing wrong with Stroman here. Uh, perhaps strand rate a little bit high at uh, you know pushing 79, 80%. You know, but I mean long term that's not a, a sustainable figure for most starting pitchers. But when your ground ball stuff is this good at a, an aggregate 3.0 per, I, that's mostly pretty sustainable for him. He can s sustain upper 80s, upper or upper 70s rather, um, pushing. 79% or whatever um, because he can get a lot of ground balls and get out of holes. And the walk rate is a little bit 
notable here, just at 9%. It's not terrible, but it's notable, and it's a little bit higher than his historical figures. But he's added in another two two more pitches, really, with the four-seamer and a cutter. He's historically been sinker slider change, keeping him very down in the strike zone. Um, but he's got a five-pitch arsenal here that's pretty damn equitable for him. So that's why I kind of like him. He's not giving up any power whatsoever, so it puts him in play at very low ownership. I am concerned with upside, but I don't think 28 points here is all that out of the realm of possibility uh, in this particular matchup. This is a big ballpark, and they're not going to hit the ball over the wall, Pittsburgh, with all that much regularity. So um, I I think Stroman's in play here. It's mostly the price tag that's going to keep me off, however. You want Oviedo on the other side, 6,200. I think this price tag is fine. However, I've I've got real concerns here. He's still got a bad fastball, still giving up two outs to the field on a 40% usage pitch. Doesn't have any other fastball like a two-seamer or a cutter to eat back some of that value. And he needs to establish early in the count. That's why we see a you know a low strike one rate, 57% high walk rate he can't get to his plus secondary offerings doesn't throw a change a lot but it's fine when he does throw it it's the slider and the curveball the good breaking stuff that he needs to work to but if you can't establish early in the count with a fastball then you're not really able to throw the slider and the curveball to get swing and miss in equitable counts when you're ahead so um that really prevents a lot of you know, real upside for Oviedo does still have 24% tick above average strikeouts to the left side. So that's fine. Um, unfortunately for Oviedo here that like the Cubs, they're all probably only going to have four lefties in the lineup, which means on the other side, he's only got a 16 and a half percent carry to the right. He's not giving up power. He's got some ground balls himself. Hard contact numbers are good. Soft contact numbers are good as well. It's just the four-seamer command and the walk rate that, that kind of takes me off. He's 6,200, and down here at this price range, I think there are a few guys that might be in play. Um, Oviedo definitely being one of them at low ownership. I think this puts him in play. I think he's got maybe 20 points in the tank, and that's really all we need out of him if we're only targeting you know 160 on DK or something in, in tournament builds. Um, certainly not a cash play, right? tournaments only and you've really got to hope that some of the strikeout stuff and getting there with the breaking stuff uh, is going to return to really his, his early season levels but it's the walk rate that's that's concerning here um but batted ball wise it's mostly pretty okay 28 percent csw given a 10 percent walk rate it's still pretty damn respectable um so I'm, I'm okay landing on a couple of Oviedo teams here against cubs because for the most part this this offense really falling off a cliff here Ever since Bellinger got hurt, uh, like their production just tanked. Now, outside of the last week or so with Mike Talkman up at the top of the lineup, they've really been underperforming quite a bit against right-handed pitching really for the last month and a half, going on two months almost. 94 WRC plus in aggregate. They're going to walk still, so there's some upside there to, to get some people on base against Oviedo. 24% strikeout rate is you know average, not great. 29% hard contact, it, below average, not great. And a 140 ISO below that it is not great. Buck 40 ground ball to fly ball here. So I think that's what puts Oviedo in play. And they might be striking out here a little bit. So we'll have to see what they do with the lineup. Um, I'd prefer if there were some more lefties in here, to be quite honest. Because he still didn't give up a lot of power to them. And the expected metrics, batted ball-wise, 244 XBA, 315 XWOBA, and a 132x ISO. Those are all pretty good numbers. So I prefer if they had more lefties in here. Um, yep, but it's okay. I'm I'm lukewarm on offense here. I don't really want to play a bunch of pieces. Talkman, I'm gonna play though because he's 2400 and leading off. He's got upside. And everybody else though, kind of lukewarm on. I think they're a fine tournament stack to get it to get to the Cubs because of bad fastball command here. But I'm really mostly off of the Pirates. I'll have some Jackson Winsky because I have him against pretty much everybody. Uh, but this is one of the few guys with such a high ground ball to fly ball ratio uh, and a ground ball rate for Marcus Stroman that I'm not all that excited about. Uh, G1 Bay is a fine value play as well. I, th- I think I'd rather play Mike Topman on the other side. But if you need a cheap second base play, Bay is 2,800 
leading off. He'll probably get five ABs. He's got a lot of speed you know, from the top of the lineup. I think that's a, a fine play as well. So, But mostly just pitching here. Okay, St. Louis and Washington. Um, I'm really not thrilled about playing Jordan Montgomery here tonight. 7,400, I like the price tag for him. Right, He's still a pretty good arm. But his problem, it, he's still exhibiting uh, some real susceptibility to the right side of the plate. 263 average, 335 Woba, and a 191 ISO to righties. Below average strikeout rate, 22%. Neutral ground ball to fly ball effectively with 22% line drives. Kind of elevated there. Low soft contact, 11%, and 36% hard contact. So he still gets onto the barrel a little bit and gives up some loud production to the righties. Now, we got a short sample here against lefties. He's always been a lead against lefties, so I'm not going to take anything out of these numbers. Lower strikeout rate, higher average allowed, like whatever. You've seen 50 hitters. I don't really care about any of this. Um, it's the right-handers that I want to go after him with when I go after him. And it's left-handed heavy lineups that I want that strike out a little bit when I'm considering playing Jordan Montgomery. And even at a somewhat attractive price tag here, fine value score, 26 in this range. Uh, price range, that is, is, is fine normally for a starting pitcher. But I'm overall not super attracted to it because he gets Washington on the other side. They strike out at an 18% clip against lefties. right? They still create a little bit here, 106 WRC+. Plus. Not going to hit for a lot of power, like over the wall necessarily, but they can create. They've got some guys with speed. And a couple of guys that do have... A, a good bit of pop, notably Elaine Thomas and a Stone Garrett against left-handed pitching. Nice little speed and power combination. Jamer a little bit. Joy Manessis has pop, but he just hasn't displayed it. He's got, you know, ISO sub-100 this year. Um, Really to both sides. Kabert behind the plate, not a lot of power from him either. So I'm not super jacked about playing Washington stacks necessarily. So it's a fine suppression matchup for Montgomery, but you really need that to happen. And since they don't strike out really at all, uh, I believe it's the lowest number on the day, split adjusted. Uh, I'm really not super attracted to playing Jordan Montgomery. I like the ownership, and I like the price tag, so that you know kind of has to put him in play for me. But I hate this matchup. Uh, I think his upside is pretty much capped. I'd rather play Mackenzie Gore on the other side at 8,000. If I'm targeting tournament upside, it's Mackenzie Gore, and it's not Jordan Montgomery. I think the matchup is you know, it's just as bad, right? But actually, it's a little bit better for Mackenzie Gore here because Cardinals against lefties, they strike out a 22% clip compared to the 18% for the Nationals. Similar run production, 101 WRC+. Plus. The main difference here is, of course, they'll hit for a little bit more power. Will the Cardinals 160 ISO and 37% hard contact? This team should be a hell of a lot better against left-handers than they've really displayed all season in terms of raw creation because they got Tommy Edmond, who hits lefties excellent, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, Wilson Contreras, Jordan Walker as well, who's been you know up and down from the minors, whatever, Going forward, I think we're probably still likely, as long as the hard contact number persists, to see this WRC Plus tick up a little bit as we get deeper into the summer here, warmer conditions really all throughout Major League Baseball. Playing a lot of their games at, uh, at Bush Stadium, that ballpark plays up power when it's warm. And you know certainly tonight, I know this game is in Washington at Nats Park, this ballpark also plays a power when it's warm. Um, might have to keep an eye out for pop-up storms, and, and Washington does all, all of their freaking late postponed, late delay shenanigans. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But if I'm getting to anything in this game, it's, it's just going to be uh, offensive, maybe a little bit of Mackenzie Gore, to be quite honest, because he's got 27.5%, 28% Ks to both sides of the plate. Now, he's very susceptible. I like the price tag here. The owner, the uh, value score, rather, is the exact same as Jordan Montgomery. Ownership is the exact same. Projection's a little bit higher. And he's got far more raw strikeout upside. If he gives up a little bit of production, he can still get out of that hole, whereas Jordan Montgomery is pretty unlikely to, I think. Um, so if I'm playing any pitchers in this spot, it's going to be Gore... I don't really like going after the Cardinals given this hard contact rate. He still gives up hard contact really to both sides of the plate. 
He's been a little susceptible to left-handers this season. Big, big numbers here. Yeah, we got a short sample here as well. Um, you know, but comparatively to Jordan Montgomery, like he's been elite his entire career against left-handers. Not so much with Mackenzie Gore. He's still a young arm. 364 average allowed to the lefties. 441 Woba. Huge number there and a 181 ISO. Yeah, he's got strikeouts, but he's also got a 16% walk rate and 38% hard contact to the lefties. So I think a couple of these lefties are now in play, even though they're going to go very right-handed heavy tonight. Probably still have a Nolan Gorman in there. Um, we'll see what they want to do. Might get Lars back. Um, not totally sure about that. They'd probably put him down at the bottom of the lineup anyway because they really like leading off Tommy Edmund against lefties. I think all of these right-handers are in play here at 34% hard contact allowed from Mackenzie Gore. I think that's in play. 162 ISO allowed, that's in play. They're not going to hit for a lot of average necessarily, and they might strike out a little bit. Um, but I think pretty much everybody here is in play outside of Jordan Montgomery. It's a suppression spot for him, but you really need him to suppress and go deep. I think that's reasonable, uh, but it's not a favorite play. I'm really questioning upside. I, I've i got concerns that he can even reach 20 points here in a lot of scenarios. Uh, I'm not all that concerned. I think it's much more probable that Mackenzie Gore gets to 25 points than it is for Jordan Montgomery to get to 20 and 24. So um, I like some Alec, or some Lane Thomas uh, and some Stone Garrett, maybe a Jamer or something from the right side against Montgomery. I don't really want to stack against him because the Nats are terrible. And I do like some Cardinal stacks as well, but I think Mackenzie Gore is very much in play in tournaments. Okay, let's move on to Colorado and Cincinnati. Noah Davis is back for them. He was a starter earlier in the season for him, uh, and then he went down with some elbow inflammation, was on the DL for a little while, and then they optioned him and sent him down to AAA um, to kind of get him right and make sure that he was good. And he's been good in his couple of rehab rehab outings. He's been down there for about you know three weeks now. 6,100 for him. Uh, he's got you know a good five-pitch mix. We can't really take a lot out of the values because we don't have much of a sample here up at the big league level this season. Strike one rate is 58%. It's not excellent, right? Chase rate is leaving it quite on the table at 22%. 25% CSW is not all that encouraging either. 8% swinging strike rate is ugh, kind of uh, <laughs> kind of worrisome there. Um, so we're going to see some ownership here once again on the Reds. I think that's fine from a contact perspective. But this is still a decent arm. It's a high upside prospect for them. He gets a lot of called strikes. 17% here. That's keeping the, the CSW as high as it is, even if it's not all that high at 25%. Um, he's got a 4-0 XFIP with a 6, you know, 6.15 ERA. Probably looking for a little bit of positive regression for him. Um, aggregate 9% walk rate. Just a buck 80 whip here. He's pitched to a bit too much contact. And that's probably due to, you know, having a little bit of um, uh, a few of his outings or appearances, I should say, at, at Coors Field. Three of them were on the road, but against some difficult teams here, right? He had Philly and he had the Dodgers and he had Arizona at Coors Field when he got uh, blasted, gave up seven earned and, and two innings. Uh, that's when he went down with elbow inflammation, right? Um in any case, he appears to be healthy. Do I want to go after the Reds here tonight? Uh, I mean, this is a dangerous lineup. Against right-handed pitching, I think they're going to be a little bit better. They did just get Joey Votto back last night, and he had a good night, right? Ellie De La Cruz is going to be far better from the left side than he will from the right side. TJ Friedel, and they have Jake Fraley back also. So from the left side, this is a very balanced and super dangerous team. So I'm not super excited about playing a what's a high contact arm in a pretty low upside spot does he have 20 points in the tank yeah I think he probably does he's but like I said he's been excellent down in in AAA and that's a real difficult league to pitch in over in the PCL um I think he's in play at 6100 as is like Oviedo who we just talked about 
going against the Reds here, it's going to be kind of difficult because Matt McLean, while he's striking out at a pretty high clip against right-handers, he's still got a good hit tool. Johnny India has been far better recently. He doesn't strike out really all that much. Same thing with a, a Spencer Steer. Um, you know, so really one through seven. Tyler Stevenson, also a fine hit tool, even though the power isn't necessarily there. So this is a difficult lineup to get through. I'm probably going to leave Noah Davis on the shelf and see what he's going to compete like at this level again. Um, so I don't really want to screw around with this too much. I'm going to have some Reds coverage once again because I really do like them from the left side of the plate. They're far more balanced uh, against right-handed pitching than they have been in the last you know several weeks. So we're going to see these numbers for them, the 91 WRC+. Plus. This is going to tick up. Uh, now with Votto, Fraley, Friedel, like they're healthy, and this is a very deadly offense. Super, super sneaky, similar to like an Arizona, um, real young team with a lot of upside over here for the Reds. Ben Lively's going on the mound for them now. I liked him, and I've I really like the arsenal that he's bringing to the table. He's got full six pitches. None of it's really been any good, right? Uh, he's had some difficult matchups, for sure. This is kind of a sneaky, difficult matchup, though, in terms of strikeouts. They're just an average strikeout team. It's mostly the line drive rate here at 24%. They don't create, right? They don't steal bases, and they have a hard time hitting the baseball over the wall with a lot of these guys. However, Ryan McMahon, Elias Diaz, these are the guys with power, even Nolan Jones a little bit. Moose has some pop still. Uh, from the left side of the plate, Jerry Profar in a small ballpark has a little bit of pop from the left side. Harold Castro, not so much. It's mostly the line drive rate. They're still a little sticky to get through the Rockies over here. And with generally low upside and you know marginal strikeout arms, I'm pretty lukewarm about going after Colorado. Um, you know, the, you can still see a lot of suppression from them or from starters against Colorado because. You know, overall, it's still a, a bad offense, right? They only create at the 87 WRC plus against righties. And outside of Coors Field, you know, they're mostly pretty attackable. But this is Cincinnati. It's a very small ballpark. And I think that puts a couple of these guys in play, notably Ryan McMahon. I think he's fantastic play here at 4,300. As is Nolan Jones. He's cooled off a little bit, but he's still at 4,000. I think that's a fine play. Probably have um, Alf back in there again tonight at his first couple of base hits from or as a member of the Rockies last night he looked pretty good getting off the schneid there a little bit they'll definitely have Elias Diaz in the in there again tonight whether he's DHing or actually catching um but he had a dinger last night Bud Black plays that hey if you hit a homer the previous day you're in the lineup the next day so I think the Rockies here are a little bit sneaky going after Ben Lively. Still gives up a little bit of pop to both sides, right? 170 ISO really to both sides, but he's got a 185 X ISO here. 324 X Woba, but that's a fine number. And a 260 XBA, that's a little bit elevated. Um, he gives up some fly balls to the lefties, so that's why I'd really like to get to a good bit of Ryan McMahon. 4,300, I think is a really nice price. Same thing with Nolan Jones. They're going to be in the middle of the lineup. And Moose will probably get a start as well. At 2,800, he's a fine tournament, you know, first base play if you want to get there. So I think some lefties here from the Rockies in particular are attractive. Um, and I'd probably mostly stay off of the righties, but you can mix in a guy here or there. Uh, most of these these guys from the right side of the plate, outside of Elias Diaz, don't have a hell of a lot of upside. I did just bring up another hit tool, Connor Kaiser, while... Um, Zeke Tovar is on the paternity list, but DK is still jacking around. They still don't have him in the player pool. Keep an eye out for that. If they do update their player list later on in the day, they may squeeze him in there. Um, they've been known to do that in the past. But uh, the righties, I'm, I'm not super interested in here. It's mostly the lefties from the Rockies. And that kind of puts Ben Lively in play a little bit here because they're only going to have three lefties, or four if you count Jerry Profar, in the lineup. Nice projection, fine ownership, I think is probably a bit elevated, but a good value score here north of 30 for somebody at 7,100. So he's certainly in play, and he can suppress because he's got a good six-pitch arsenal here. Um, so I think both sides are really in play, mostly the Reds here. I'm probably just going to stay off of Noah Davis 
even though he's got a, a five-pitch arsenal as well, and I'm looking for some positive regression for him. This is a super dangerous lineup that I'm not sure I want to attack with a low upside arm. Okay, let's move on. Oakland and Cleveland. Luis Medina on the mound. Um, he's, like we mentioned at the outset, it's probably going to be Ken Waldachuk opening for them, and that puts a lot of righties from Cleveland in play. Waldachuk has serious, serious problems with the right side. It's power. It's hard contact. It's fly balls. I mean, top to bottom. Ever since he came up last season, it's been awful. And good thing for Oakland, he's probably only going to go an inning or so. Um, so he might be able to suppress a little bit of contact, but that does squarely put Ahmed Rosario in play at 3,400. And also, of course, Josie Ramirez. You can play him, you know, against most everybody in baseball. Um, maybe it, I mean, maybe that gives Josh Bell a little bit of upside, but he kind of stinks. So it's mostly the lefties that we want to attack with here. Once again, from Cleveland, they're going to be popular going after Luis Medina. He gives up a 281 average, pretty big number, short sample, but notable for sure. 368 WOBA, 228 ISO to the lefties. He's got a 228 X ISO, and that's to both sides. He's been he's been getting really beat up apart um, or torn apart and beat up by the right-handers. 293 average allowed in a far larger sample. 405 WOBA, 323 ISO. K rate's hovering at 20-21% at to both sides. Walk rate hovering at about 10% as well. Lefties we want that can make a lot of hard contact and get the baseball in the air here, and that's Josie Ramirez for sure. It's Josh Naylor a little bit as well, even though he hits some ground balls. Stephen Kwan, he's going to hit ground balls too. So it's going to be, I think, a, a little fishy for, for us to get to outsized Cleveland stacks here. Now, in his couple of appearances out of the bullpen as a long reliever, Luis Medina's actually been serviceable. He's been okay. He did the same thing against Tampa. Went four and two-thirds, gave up four runs, but he struck out five, and he survived a little bit. In his first appearance out of the bullpen this year as a long reliever against Milwaukee, went five, struck out six, gave up just two runs. So there's some suppression concerns for sure. He's not going to strike out a lot of people. And that pl really obviously plays into Cleveland's strengths here, 19% strikeout rate for them. But despite having put up a real crooked number against Zach Davies the other day, uh, you they didn't they did that without hitting a single baseball over the wall. So that's how you need to get there with Cleveland. It's full stacks. They need to circle the base pads, and they need everybody seeing it and everybody hitting for a good bit of contact in order for full stacks to get there. And I think they're probably going to be too popular today for that probabilistic upside. Um, they just don't get there. This is an 11-game slate. Now, they're very cheap, and it's a good spot. So, yeah, it's warranted to have some exposure here. But I would not be surprised if Cleveland really kind of shits the bed at very high ownership here because they're not a very high upside offense. 121 ISO, that's a, one of the lowest numbers on the day. May, split adjusted may very well be the lowest number. 19% strikeout rate is good, but it's a lot of ground ball contact with no hard contact. The 25% hard contact rate is the lowest number for a team split adjusted. 86 WRC+. plus. So despite guys with speed like a Steven Kwan, Josie Ramirez, Ahmed Rosario, Andres Jimenez got some speed, Miles Straw can't get on base, so we can't take advantage of his speed, et cetera, et cetera, right? They just don't create runs because they are they don't hit the baseball out. And on full slates, you kind of need that. So I'd probably prefer to get two short stacks and well-priced guys as one-offs than full stacks because, it, as we mentioned with the Garrett Cole, that's going to be a chalk build. It allows you to get to Garrett Cole with ease when you stack Cleveland here because they're all so cheap. Every one of them outside of Josie Ramirez is under 4000 So... <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that's hard to to really stomach with a lot of uh, a lot of ownership here, and what I think could be a serviceable outing for Luis Medina. Not going to play him, of course, but um, yeah, I'm pretty lukewarm on Cleveland. I'll I definitely have some coverage, but uh, probably come in under the field. Aaron Savali on the mound probably going to come in under the field here too. I want to get to a little bit of Oakland, and as a matter of fact, Oakland is popping as the second best value stack of the day. It's mostly because they're cheap, right? Ruiz at 3,200, Noda 26, Rooker 31, Seth Brown 25, Jace Peterson, you know, all the way down. Each one of these guys is sub 3,000 outside of those two, Ruiz and Rooker. So I want to get to 
probably the top five, maybe even the top six here from Oakland as well, and go after Savali. He didn't strike anybody out either, right? 19.5% K rate. Now, he does have, at least in this short sample, a slightly higher strikeout rate to the left side. He's got the cutter here, which takes me off a little bit of these lefties, like a Noda, but I'm still going to play Seth Brown, 2,500, um, against a guy that's not very likely to throw it past him. This is a short sample. Historically, Aaron Savali just doesn't have strikeouts. Early in, I mean, he, he was hurt for a little while. Um, so, so early here this season in his sample, it's short, just five starts, but a 73.5% strike one rate. He's very efficient. That's what keeps him in the rotation. We mentioned this in his last start compared to a Zach Plezak, who they DFA'd. Um, he's super, super efficient, and he sequences well. He's got five and six pitches that he uses now. So against Oakland, that puts him in, squarely in play. At 7,900, I'm not jacked about this price tag. I would rather play Mackenzie Gore in tournaments if I'm after upside. But this is Oakland, and this is a bad team, and he's a serviceable and good enough arm uh, to pick through Oakland last six or even seven innings here. He didn't even have to strike out a lot of guys. He can suppress a lot and and really put up a, a fine score. At 25 points, they could win the baseball game, and he only needs 20 points worth of production, give or take. And that's perfectly within range for Savali. So I think he's in play. Um, but I'd like to get to some Oakland coverage on the other side because he pitches to 82.5% contact. And that's Oakland's main weakness, obviously, right? It's strikeouts. 26% here. They don't create. The only guy that's going to move is Asturio Ruiz, but he moves a lot, right? He's got, what, 35 bags now or something like that. Not going to hit it over the wall are these guys, but Noda, Rooker, and Seth Brown have pop. Jace Peterson and even a little bit of J.J. Blade, they have pop. Shea Langlier's behind the plate. He's 2,200 now. That's an okay punt catcher play if you want to get there today. He has some pop. So uh, I think offense is very squarely in play. If I had to choose, though, in a full stack, I'd rather play Oakland. I'm probably just going to stay off of pitching mostly, but I'll have a little bit of Aaron Savali coverage. And it's certainly not 16%, though. I think that's a bit aggressive. Okay, Boston, Minnesota, Cutter Crawford on the mound. I think he's in play at 5,400. Um, I'd rather play him than Luis Medina, I'll tell you that much, because he's got 33% K rate to the left side of the plate. However, he also has a 218 ISO against lefties and an 060 ground ball to fly ball with 35% hard contact. So that's concerning. And I want to play some twins on the other side, right? Eddie Juliana, I think this is a pretty damn good play. He should be able to get the baseball on a line here against Cutter Crawford. Alex Kirilov, I like a lot at first and outfield eligibility, 3,200 for him. Max Kepler, 3,000 flat, pretty damn good play there too. These guys don't strike out a hell of a lot against right-handed pitching. Kirilov maybe a little bit. Joey Gallo definitely going to whiff. 3,800, not super jacked about that price tag, but he's dual eligible. First in the outfield. Um, he's in the seven hole, and he's got all the power in the world if he can make contact. He's probably going to strike out a good bit here, but if he does make contact, it's going to go a long, long way. It's very warm once again in, um, in Twin Cities tonight, so I think Weather-wise, this is one of the better environments, certainly. And we can go after Cutter Crawford. However, because of the very high strikeout rate to the left side of the plate and some guys from the right side, notably a Byron Buxton, that will strike out also, I think that puts him in play at a super cheap price tag. Now, in his last outing, he only went about four innings. He got yanked at 80 pitches because they're still trying to stretch him out due to the injuries they've got and the shenanigans going on in the rotation. Um, he should be good for 85, 90 pitches tonight, which could put him in line for five and even six inning upside if he's really blasting through the Twins, who are overall just an average creation offense against right-handed pitching. 102 WRC plus, 27% K rate. That really keeps them off the board. So it puts Cutter Crawford in play. 33% hard and 172 ISO are nice figures here. Buck 10, ground ball to fly ball, 22% line drive rate. Nice figures from an offensive standpoint for the Twins. So I think everybody is in play from the Twins, and Cutter Crawford is, is in play as well because they're a high ups, or a high variance team, rather, Minnesota. And you can go after them in tournaments, certainly with very cheap arms here, at very low ownership. And he's going to be stretched out. I generally like going after Cutter Crawford for the most part, but in his short-ish sample this year, 92 hitters, seen from the left side, and a lot of appearances out of the bullpen. So, you know, noisy. we got to take this stuff with a grain of salt. Good numbers against lefties outside of the power that he's allowed. Earlier in the season, he was getting bludgeoned. So these are mostly imbalanced because of that. 
and he's been damn good against right-handers outside of a 268 average allowed. 098 ISO to the righties. Once again, those are mostly situational appearances out of the bullpen, and it's just a 15% strikeout rate. So I think it puts Buxton and Correa at his particular price tag, 4300 there. Buxton in play, certainly, because he's unlikely to strike out nearly as much. He's just more likely to you know, get hurt. Um, 5000 for him. I, I like the price tag better than the 5600 he was yesterday. So I think full twin stacks are very much in play here. They're middling in value and middling in ownership so far. So I think this is a, a nice tournament stack to consider. But Cutter Crawford in play also. Bailey Ober on the mound, 9200 I hate this price tag, man. I think he's got some some upside generally against very right-handed heavy lineups because of the strikeout stuff to righties, 27.5%. However, he has a 41.5% hard contact rate to righties and a 185 ISO. That's not all that thrilling. So I kind of want to stay off of this, I think. At very low ownership, I think he's in play. But, man, this price tag, I think, is a bit too high. Most of the upside, I think, is priced in in this particular matchup. We saw that Boston even got to a Pablo Lopez a little bit last night. 106 WRC+, plus, so they're averaging creation, but they still don't strike out a lot, about two and a half, three ticks better than average. 175 ISO, 32% hard contact, similar to the Twins over here. So I think they're also in play. The difference is they're not going to strike out nearly as much, and they're going to hit for more average. So um, hard contact-wise, this is really, really worrisome against righties because he's an 055 ground ball to fly ball guy is Bailey Ober, with that much hard contact, that's a, a disaster, right? And that's why you see a lot of power come here. Warm weather, I think some of these right-handers from Boston could very much get into some Bailey over here tonight. Justin Turner should be back. Just got a day off. Doesn't strike out a lot. Sole third base now, which is kind of goofy. Um, slightly more playable than his sole first base earlier in the season. So he should be back tonight. I think that's a fine play with a very low strikeout rate. He'll make some hard contact still. Adam Duvall, I think, is a pretty decent play as well. 5000 elevated price tag, but it's a fine hard contact upside spot for him. And you can play all of the lefties, too, of course, because of the lower strikeout rate against lefties for Ober. Um, you know, good change up here, so he may be able to induce some ground balls, but he's still, you know, a, a four-seamer slider guy that gets weak pop-ups here, and he's on the barrel a quite quite a bit here. So I think we're going to see some regression. He's got a 265 ERA with an XFIP two runs higher than that, 81% strand rate, a whip under one. Uh, you know, we got some underlying metrics here su suggesting that he could get bludgeoned here soon. And I think Boston could very well serve uh, equitable for us in, in that respect. So I think they're playable. Um, they're expensive, but... I think a, a pretty decent tournament stack here. I think everybody is really in play. Crawford, Ober, to a certain extent, as well as Boston and Minnesota. Interesting tournament game there. Okay, Texas and the White Sox. Nathan Eovaldi, I'd probably rather play him than, than Garrett Cole, I think. 200 more expensive, and I like doing this, even though it didn't work out last night with Hunter Brown. Um, it still certainly worked better than, than clicking in all of the Corbin Burns, right? 9% ownership here on Nathan Eovaldi. I think this is fine, right? This is a bad offense over here from the White Sox, and they're missing their leadoff hitter in Tim Anderson still, um, who doesn't really strike out and makes their lineup a, a bit more difficult to get through. Now, they'll probably lead off like a Benintendi or something, right? They're still at very playable price tags, and they've got some guys that don't strike out a lot, but overall, 23% strikeout rate, it's average. They just don't create. Nobody on this team runs... Because if they run, they all get hurt, and and then they gotta sit, they gotta sit, right? Yoan Mankata is still out, um, and as we mentioned, the only guy with real speed here is Tim Anderson, and he's probably gonna be out again. 150 ISO, it's average. Hard contact is below average. 23% K rate, it's average. Too many ground balls here. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball with some infield fly balls too. So they don't walk, and they pop a lot of balls up. Really weak offense here, even though they got to Andrew Heaney a little bit last night with Luis Robert, Andrew Vaughn types hitting the baseball out. Unlikely to be able to do that with the same regularity against Nathan Diavaldi. He's still giving up hard contact, but the fly balls are nowhere to be found now. He, like, he's got ground balls. Like, look at this splitter value. Combine it with the four-seamer cutter. Like, this is a super, super equitable three-pitch mix here. And then you throw the curveball, 
good breaker on top of that, getting value out of this as well with an out above average. Very balanced, and I attacked Nathan Eovaldi early in the season, but he's been, like, there's no doubt, he's been fantastic. He doesn't walk anybody, 5% walk rate, he doesn't get barreled at all, 6.5% barrel rate. So despite the slightly elevated hard contact, it's mostly like medium type of contact, right? Because he still has an average 88 mile an hour exit velo, you know, in the stat cast department. So I think he's very much in play here, certainly at 9% ownership. You can go after the White Sox. It's a bad offense over here, man, against right-handed pitching. And he gets a lot of ground balls. They hit a lot of ground balls. So sign me up. Really, I don't want anybody from the left side outside of maybe a Stone Min 2000, Gavin Sheets in the outfield, but he might be in the 7 or the 8 hole on the home team. It's likely, I mean, to get blasted here tonight because they get Texas on the other side, and Dylan Cease is on the mound, who walks the whole country. 14% walk rate to righties, right, and a 46% hard contact to righties. Like, I, I'm still not doing it with Dylan Cease. Now, I know the price tag is way down. I know he had a good outing against Dodgers in his last start. That's because Dave Roberts sat uh, J.D. Martinez, and they only had one right-hander, and Will Smith was out as well. Um, they only had one right-hander in the lineup, and that was Mookie at the top. So that made made it you know, pretty equitable for Dylan Cease. He still has, you know, with Max Muncie out, that that made it a, an attackable lineup. His main problem here is right-handers. It's too many walks, and it's way too much hard contact here at 46%. Hasn't fully translated into power, but he's going to keep giving this up, and he's going to keep walking people because the mechanics are still broken. So I'm, not, I'm still not dealing with this. I, I do like the price tag. And I do like the projection and the value score and et cetera. And the projections are smarter than me. But sometimes we just got to make decisions. And I'm not going to do it against one of the best teams in baseball in Texas over here. I'm going to have Texas coverage again. They're expensive, but I don't particularly care. Corey Seager's a top five hitter in baseball. When he is healthy, this kid is elite. And he's probably leading the AL MVP race right now. Um, I mean, he'd certainly get my vote. I love this kid. And when he is healthy, I mean, he is he makes this entire lineup tick. Marcus Semien at the at the top is no slouch, you know. Nor are Nate Lowe and Adelis Garcia, right? A lot of upside there for these guys too. Josh Young, he's probably going to strike out a good bit in this matchup, right? At a 31% clip to, you know, for Dylan Cease against the right-handers. Um, but Jonah Heim is very serviceable from the left side. They have Robbie Grossman, Leody Tavares. That'll switch hit as well. So this is still a, a difficult, sticky matchup. As we mentioned yesterday, every damn one of these guys, no matter who it is, coming off the bench, you know, like a Robbie Grossman or you know Mitch Garver types, it like they all have high on base percentage, high power, and they make a lot of good, really solid, loud contact. So this is a super dangerous team. I don't want to deal with Dylan Cease today. Um, I'm going to stack Texas on the other side. If he beats me, he beats me. But uh, I want to I want to go after him, even in a bigger ballpark over here in, in Chicago tonight. So um, mostly just like I, like Texas, I think, right? Nathan Eovaldi, I don't like the price tag. Don't get me wrong there. But I love the ownership, and I like the pivot off of Garrett Cole. And a good bit of Texas, I'm not dealing with the Dylan Cease. I don't even want any of the White Sox. I'll probably just stay off of them completely. Okay, Arizona-Milwaukee, Ryan Nelson on the mound. I'm not deal dealing with this, right? 15% K rate. Strike one rate's great. Chase rate is uh, whatever, but he's got an 8% swinging strike rate, 83% contact rate. He's got a 530 ERA with expected metrics right in the same range. Buck 50 whip. No strikeouts. He gives up power to the left side, hard contact to the left side. That's mostly how I want to attack. And he gives up fly balls with 33% hard contact to the righties. No thank you. He's not going to throw it by anybody, and he's going to put some people on base for free, certainly from the left side. So I think you can play everybody top to bottom here from the Brewers. I think they're a really nice tournament stack here, much more so than they were last night when Merrill Kelly tore them apart. We talked about that a little bit in that Merrill Kelly, well, he's got double the strikeout rate here that Ryan Nelson does, and they didn't match up Milwaukee very well with, with Merrill Kelly, even though he gave up a lot of hard contact to lefty himself. He got so many ground balls. That's not the case here with Ryan Nelson. So I want to get to Milwaukee and play pretty much everybody, like I said. 
Um, top to bottom, righties, lefties, I think they're a really good tournament stack, and they're kind of off the board here. Not going to be all that popular. And they're at very playable price tags. They're going to allow you plenty of flexibility. So I like I like Christian Yelich, even though he's still going to hit some ground balls. He still makes hard contact against left-handers, and a buck 30 ground ball to fly ball for Ryan Nelson is much easier to get through for Christian Yelich and his 2-0 ground ball to fly ball than a 180 ground ball to fly ball for Merrill Kelly, for example. Um, I might even play a little bit of Jesse Winker here tonight, even though he's terrible. Willie Adamas, I like this at 44. Rowdy Telez, I like this a good bit at 43. Willie Contreras is probably the, the most... Um, probably the player I'm most bearish on price-wise at 4,700. Not super jacked about that, but you can play him in stacks. He's fine, and you can play everybody else too. Uh, they did just pick up Ramel Tapia. This is a high upside spot for him as well because he's got ground ball and strikeout problems for the most part, and he'll be able to get the ball on a line here a little bit. 24% line drive rate to the lefties for Ryan Nelson, 22.5% to the right-handers. So, Good upside spot for the Brewers here. Uh, I, I like them a pretty decent bit. And they're only $1.25 in the betting market. So despite the fact that they got Colin, Colin Ray going on the mound um, against Arizona, who's a real damn good offense, I think $1.25 seems a little bit cheap. 5900 for Ray. I'm not I'm not going to be playing this. Um, I'd rather play some other guys in the range, like a Cutter Crawford, you know, in a more gulpy spot. Um, he gives up power to the left side, too. Yeah, he's got a full 11 starts now for the Brewers. Been very durable for them. Ab average walk rate's fine, 9%. Barrel rate's good, 7.5%. 21.5% K rate is, you know, it's not going to wow you or anything, but it's been serviceable. Um, but against Arizona, this is a below average upside arm in Colin Wright. And this is a an offense that really capitalizes on below average matchup or above average matchups for them below average arms right on the other side he'll give up some fly balls and i think that's attackable here with arizona 219 iso allowed with a little bit of average 250 average and 352 woba to the lefties so that's mostly how i want to attack good thing for the d-backs they got a lot of lefties over here right and against right-handed pitching 110 wrc plus 19 percent strikeout rate 185 iso sneaky pop and they'll get the baseball on the line here a bucket a quarter ground ball to fly ball but a fine 20 percent even line drive rate they get on they create and with jerry perdomo at the top of the list he's going to steal as well Car corbin carroll of course um and if it weren't for Ronald Acuna, Corbin Carroll be also leading the MVP race in the National League. So he's a super high upside, and you can play him in this spot absolutely. 5700 price creeping up there, so it's kind of getting a little gulpy there, but um, very much playable still. Cattell Marte at 5000 flat. I like this price. I think this is a fine spot. Christian Walker and Lourdes Gurriel from the right side, I'm cool with that too. Uh, from, you know, against righties, he... Colin Ray gets a lot more ground balls, right? Buck 90 ground ball to fly ball. So we want guys that can get it in the air. That's Christian Walker. Uh, less thrilled about Emmanuel Manny Rivera at uh, first and third base eligibility. He's cheap, and he's fine in, in stacks if you get a lot of Arizona exposure, I think. But doesn't really have a lot of power upside necessarily. He'll make a good bit of hard contact. We want him more so against lefties. But I like Alec Thomas here uh, a real good bit. He made some changes down in the minors in the swing, hopefully it'll keep his damn feet happy in a batter's box and allow him to, you know, be solidified and actually make contact. Uh, we saw last night that he got into a ball. So um, made some changes here, and he's still very cheap in the outfield, 2,200. And I like Carson Kelly as well. Jake McCarthy will probably stay off because I think he stinks. Um, but they did just send Josh Rojas down in a kind of surprising move. So he'll likely get optioned Jake McCarthy when Rojas is ready to come back. In any case, uh, I like getting to Arizona here tonight. Playable price tags for sure, really top to bottom outside of Cattell Marte and, and Corbin Carroll. Those are the only guys you got to pay for. Uh, Going to stay off of the Colin Ray here. This is super dangerous offense to go after, and mostly offense in this game. I think game stacks here are very much in play. Okay, Mets-Houston. Um, Mets made me look like an idiot last night getting after Hunter Brown. And I also stacked against Scherzer, so that didn't really work out very well. Um, Justin Verlander on the mound. I'm going to go right back to Houston. Uh, 
Now, Scherzer, he's got 30% K rate to the left side, and that really played into his strength last night. Right? We talked about that. However, here with Justin Verlander, where's the strikeout stuff to either side? Right? He didn't have any swinging strikes. He's got eight starts, and it's been up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Literally every other start for him has been bad, you know, and he's just getting completely torched. Nine, 10% swinging strike rate for Verlander. This is concerning here. Um, so I think he's still on the mend a little bit. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, that's really not changed here. But a 91 mile an hour average exit velo for Verlander is super concerning. No four seamer value. Slider's still good and is never really used to change all that much, but there's no curveball value at all. So he's a one pitch guy at the moment if he's got, you know, downside of the variance on the four seamer. So that's concerning. Now, still looking for a little bit of regression for Verlander to be better, but hard contact to the right handers here 39% fly balls, uh, 210 ISO allowed. Like he's given up average here too, 260 average allowed. So. I think I want to get to Houston again. It's a small ballpark, and it plays into power hitters from the right side because you only got to hit it 192 feet to hit it into the Crawford boxes. So I want to get to see some Houston again, and, of course, I'm going to play Kyle Tucker too. So um, I think offense is very much in play, Verlander in play, because he's 7,300. And this is still Verlander. I think we're looking for regression, but eventually he's going to got – He's going to have to prove it to us, right? So I think Houston's in play. I think Verlander, it, you know, if we're just going by this pattern he's displayed this season, like his last start was good against the Yankees, and it's literally been every other start where he has been torched. No strikeout stuff, and the suppression is not there, where he's given up at least four runs. Um, yeah, if we're going to play that pattern, then, yeah, let's go after Houston and stay off of Verlander. But he's 7,300. I think you kind of have to have a little bit, maybe not a full 10% for me. Um, you know, we'll see where I come in. But uh, I think both sides are playable here. Got to side with Houston, I think, given these numbers so far. Framber on the mound, 10-2 for him. I think he's playable, too, and a little bit more playable than Garrett Cole, even though it's a bad strikeout matchup. Now... Some righties over here from the Mets have been heating up a little bit, right? They did just get Pete Alonso back, uh, but Tommy fan has been fantastic over the last week or so. Frankie Alvarez, he swings out of his shoes from behind the plate, and Starling Marte steals bases still when he can get on base. Not hitting for you know all that much power, really no power at all is Marte, but Frankie Lindor's had a couple of good days in a row. Um, buoyed a little bit by some, you know, noisy production. He had five ribs last night, for example, stole a, a base the night before. It's a little noisy, um, but hopefully starting to heat up a little bit. And he has been horrific all, yeah, really for the last month, month and a half, hitting sub 200. Um, the problem with Framber here, we've talked about this in his last several starts, it's a bad change of value. He's given up nearly two outs to the field on this changeup. He's right in the middle of the damn plate with it. He cannot throw it past anybody and get ground balls with this anymore. And that's what's dropped this, the ground ball rate from north of three and pushing four last season to two and a half to one to both sides this year. Strikeout rate is down as well because he's not getting whiffs on the change. This is a bad pitch for him now. And he still has not figured this out. We've talked about this for the last you know, month and a half nearly with Framber. So he's very much attackable with right-handers. Look at this hard contact rate to the right. He's 39%. It's not translating into power because he still has very high ground ball rates to the righties, but he can get a little bit on the line here with this pitch in particular, and he's still throwing it a boatload to the righties. So I think that's how he's attackable. Uh, if you want to go after Framber here, get off of some of this 15, 20% ownership, whatever, that's fine. Uh, I think he's in play, of course, because this is still a really below average offense. But Starling Marte, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso, Tommy Pham, Frankie Alvarez is a full right-handed heavy stack. That's in play. I generally don't want to go after Houston's bullpen, uh, one of the better units in the league, of course. But you can mix in like a Brandon, Mim a Brandon Nimmo uh, or maybe one of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, Eddie Escobar or something, you'll switch hit. Something like that. It's okay. Maybe a, I mean, you're not likely to see a Danny Vogelbach. It'll probably be Eddie Escobar. 
DHing or a Mark Kana might be in there. Like, who knows what they're going to do at the bottom. But, uh, you know, a couple of these guys are playable. I'd probably prefer just short stacks like Pete Alonzo and Tommy Pham at a cheap price tag. Frankie Alvarez right behind the plate. That takes up a, fur, a first base and a catcher spot for you, and then you can you know mix in Tommy Pham in the outfield. I think that's a fine stack to get to. Mostly going to have to side with Houston and Framber, though, if I got to rank them. I don't know. It's probably Houston, Framber, then the Mets, then Verlander, but I think it's pretty close between um, you know the Mets and Verlander there. Definitely not a, a favorite for me. I think it's okay to be eating $1.50 in the betting markets on Houston here tonight. Okay, San Diego and San Francisco. Seth Lugo on the mound. We're getting him back. He had a strained calf. He's been out for about a month, month and a half. But he's not going to go on a rehab start. He's been throwing sim games. And we saw this earlier in the season with Jamison Tyon. When you don't send guys out on a rehab start, like simulated games are not are not real life games, right? They're not full speed games. And if you don't have a rhythm of you know a full month worth of a month's worth of work. As a starting pitcher, like you're probably going to struggle. These are still big league lineups, so I want to get to some of the Giants here. Like I'm not overly impressed with any of Lugo's numbers. Is is sample size here against lefties this season and eight starts that he made uh, is still a little bit short. 27% K rate there, but he gave up a 183 ISO and 40% hard contact. So no thanks. 26% line drive rate against lefties. Uh, that's really worrisome. Even though he's at a buck fifty ground ball to fly ball, um, you know these guys hit a lot of fly balls, right? So this really plays into the Giants' strengths here from the left side of the plate. Lamont Wade, sure, he's forty nine hundred though, so I'm not jacked about that. But I really like Jock Peterson here, forty six hundred. Michael Conforto, forty two. Yaz, who hit two bombs last night, unfortunately, uh, he is at thirty six hundred though, so he's still playable price tag. I have to see what they do at the bottom of the lineup with like a Patty Bailey behind the plate or uh, Brandon Crawford. He'll probably be in there. Maybe a Blake Sable, something like that. Um, I have to you know, keep an eye out for what the Giants want to do because they play all kinds of stupid matchup games. Um, but I like the Giants here a, a, a good bit for some sneaky offense. I don't think anybody's going to be playing them tonight, but I don't want to play Seth Lugo. Uh, 7,500. I like. He's gonna have to show me that he can pick through a very dangerous lineup here with a month off. Uh, maybe, maybe he does, and maybe he gets there. I think that's fine. But I'm not sacrificing anything here by staying off of one and at two percent ownership. Does this probably warrant because they strike out so much a little bit of coverage? I mean, maybe. But I don't know. I'm not all that interested in it. I'd rather just play some of the Giants. Probably not in full stacks because, like, they're righties. I'm not jacked about playing Tyro Estrada 5,400 on a full 11 gamer or, or even, like, a Luis Matos, you know, in the outfield. But he's only got Lugo in 100 hitters, 17% strikeout rate against the right side. Uh, still some ground balls there, so you need somebody that hits it in the air. So that's why I'm not super thrilled about that. I'd rather just get to short lefty stacks, Jock, Conforto, Yaz, um, you know, some of these guys, maybe a Patty Bailey to spread out the positional exposure there. Uh, Disco on the mound for the Giants, 6,700 for him against Padres. We're not going to do this. He's only got a 12.5% strikeout rate to the left side, and that's Juan Soto territory, even though he hit also two bombs last night. Uh, I don't particularly care. When Soto's seeing the baseball like this, um, he's insanely comfortable at the plate. You can pay 5900 for him, and he's probably underpriced, to be quite honest. Against Discofani, like, he's still got the bad changeups, ups got the bad four-seamer, and now he's not even getting value out of the two-seamer either. And he still mains this pitch, even against lefties, so no thanks. I mean, he's throwing the slider a lot, which is giving him the swing and miss against right-handers, which would probably put him in play a little bit. Tatis still going to strike out a little bit, but Manny, you know, not so much. Xander, not so much. Gary Sanchez, yeah, sure, he will. I think the Padres are a very interesting tournament stack. Not a lot of people are going to be playing this here tonight because it's in San Francisco, but there's still a 15-mile-an-hour win there. Now, I know that the ballpark for the most part, minimizes a lot of wind impact. But when we, but that's like 15 miles an hour or less. Once you get up into 15 to 20 mile an hour winds, baseball will fly. You know, it's like, 
you got to hit like, guys are still hitting the baseball hard and they're getting it up in the air and it's still get a carry when you got that kind of wind. So uh, no matter what ballpark you're in. Um, so I like a little bit of the lefties mostly here. Uh, Jake Cronenworth, I think is fine. He lost his dual eligibility though. So 4,500 to first base on a full slate is not all that great, but it's uh, very much playable with hard contact and super low strikeouts from Discofani to the left side. I think it's uh, very much in play here. Neutral ground ball to fly ball to the lefties too. So um, very much playable. You want a fly ball hitter against uh, from the right side against Discofani, and that's probably a Manny or a Bogart, something like that from the right side. You can play Tatis though. He's, you can play him against everybody. So that's fine. Mostly offense here for me. I'm just going to stay off of pitching, which is kind of surprising for a game in San Francisco. That's probably going to burn me. Who knows? Uh, last game here, Dodgers, Angels, Clayton Kershaw on the mound. I want to play him. 10-5, he's the guy at 10,000 or above that I really want to get to. Now, 25% ownership, I'm okay eating this. Uh, I'm not super thrilled about it, though. It's not, you know, I'll probably come in like 20% or something like that. Um, just to have good coverage because Kershaw is Kershaw and he is like his numbers here. There's not a single thing wrong. He does have a high strand rate. It's probably going to regress a little bit to his, um, career averages where it's 79% or thereabout. Uh, but for the most part, everything here for Kershaw is excellent, right? He's getting ground balls or right? he's got very high whiff stuff to the right side, which is mostly what he's seeing this year. You got 55 hitters against lefties. I don't care about a 15% strikeout rate for Kershaw against left-handers. Uh, that will correct over a larger sample. So we're not going to take any stock in, in those numbers because the angels here, they're still going to have you know, a lot of right-handed hitters. They'll probably have eight righties in the lineup plus Shohei. Uh, now Shohei is Shohei. So if you want to take a shot with him, he'd probably be the only one because everyone, Every other one of these guys from the right side um, is a below average hitter, average or below average hitter, and this is a well below average spot against probably the the stone best left hander um, in baseball, unless I'm forgetting somebody. I don't think so. Um, you know, maybe like a McClanahan is up there too, or something like that. In any case, Kershaw's Kershaw, and I'm not worried about going after Taylor Ward here or Mike Trout. Trout still. Like, despite a good batted ball profile matchup here, because Trout's a fly ball hitter, he's still going to strike out a 30% clip. Something is drastically wrong with Trout. Like, you could get to maybe a Brandon Drury, but he's 4400 I don't want to pay a normal price tag for him in a down matchup. Um, same thing with Taylor Ward. Hunter Renfro, no thank you. Chad Wallach, maybe at 2600 Price adjusted, that's probably the best play. But, like, I, I don't want to play any of the Angels here. I'd rather just play Kershaw. I got a feeling he'll probably get dinged for a run or two here. Because they still have a high upside from the right side of the plate against most every lefty in baseball do the Angels. 113 WRC+, plus, 22% K rate, hit for a little bit of power, 170, and some hard contact. So that's there in the tank. They can get to baseball on a line, 21% line drive rate. So that's okay. Um you know, but most of all, I'm, I'm just going to side with Kershaw here. Probably not going to try and get a lot of leverage necessarily because I think this is still a, a little bit of a dangerous spot. But I'm going to have healthy Kershaw exposure for sure. On the other side, you get Reed Detmers on the mound. He's also got a super high strikeout rate, 28% to – and it's to the righties. We talked about this with Detmers, though. I'm going to stay off of him tonight. Um, I've been shorting Detmers for a year and a half. I don't, I still don't know how he does this. 36, 37% hard contact to right-handers, 31% line drive rate, 075 ground ball to fly ball, 29.5% K rate. I don't know where the hell that comes from. And a 113 ISO. How does he do this? I do not get it. You cannot sustain these contact, this batted ball profile and not give up any, any power. It's just not possible. Now, you could strike out some guys, yeah, sure, but you can't give up this this kind of fly ball rate with this kind of hard contact rate uh, and this kind of line drive rate without giving up power. And this is the Dodgers over here, so no thanks. They're probably only going to have one lefty in the lineup tonight, and that'll be Freddie Freeman. You really want to go after Freddie Freeman with a, a lefty that doesn't strike anybody out from the left side? I mean, yeah, we got a short sample here, but like he's a below average lefty here despite a very high strikeout rate to the right side. Um, 
I'm looking for some contact regression to come to Reed Detmers, and I'm going to go after him with the Dodgers here. I think they're a pretty damn good stack, and they're about third in value right now, even given Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith, J.D. Martinez all north of 5K, Mookie and Freddie north of 6K at the top of the lineup. Everybody down at the bottom is super cheap, and you have to play some of these guys to make that happen. Chris Taylor, sure. Uh, he's going to strike out a lot, though, in this matchup, very likely. Johnny Lu- DeLuca, he's the stone men. You can play him. High upside um, outfield piece for you. Miggy Rojas doesn't strike out at all, but he kind of stinks anymore. Miggy Vargas at a playable 3,100, going to make a good bit of contact as well. So I like the Dodgers here. I'm going to try and get to them as much as I can. Now, does 6,900 put Reed Detmers in play with a 28% K rate, 29% K rate? When the Dodgers are going to go super right-handed heavy? Eh, Maybe, I guess. I mean, the value score puts him in play here. And maybe it's just my bias. I think I might have to land on a couple of pieces just to have a little bit of coverage, but I'm not thrilled about it, man. Um, I'm probably just going to try and stay off of it. I don't know if I'm going to exit because, you know, the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they're pretty low upside. And there's some strikeouts in here still for sure. But Mookie doesn't strike out. Freddie doesn't strike out. Will Smith doesn't strike out. J.D. Martinez doesn't strike out. So it's going to be pretty difficult to get through those top four. Um, so mostly just the Dodgers here and Kershaw staying off of some Detmers, maybe an Angels piece here or there, but like, I don't know, just as some coverage, but I don't want to really pay their normal price tags in a super down matchup. Okay, that's it. Uh, just over an hour here today, so let's quickly go through a review. Seattle and the Yankees, like Kirby, I like Cole, but not as much as the field, certainly. I'm um, going to have a couple Seattle coverage stacks here, maybe a Yankees piece here or there. Mostly like a Rizzo from the left side of the plate um, or a cheap Jake Bowers leading off, something like that. But everybody else I don't really want to deal with, to be quite honest. Chicago and Pittsburgh, Marcus Stroman, yeah, but I'm not super thrilled with the price tag. Uh, I think it's a fine suppression matchup for him. Makes him a good tournament play at just 5% ownership, but I'm concerned with upside for sure. Yohan Oviedo, I think he's in play, as a matter of fact, at 6,200, but he's got to get to fastball command. I'd really like it if there were more lefties that that Chicago puts in the lineup tonight. Probably pretty unlikely, so it might just keep me off here. But I think he's in play. Um, A Pittsburgh piece here or there against Stroman, maybe just like a Jack Sawinski or a deep G1 Bay, Brian Reynolds type of three-man or something, but that's Pretty much it. Not super intriguing there. Cubs are a really off-the-board tournament stack. Uh, You can get to them because of the low strikeout rate against righties and the power and fastball command walk rate, really, against everybody for you on Oviedo here. St. Louis, Washington, no Jordan Montgomery here for me tonight, I I don't think. Um, I want to probably play a couple of Washington pieces on the other side. I'm just concerned with upside for Montgomery. I don't think he's got suppression and strikeout upside in this particular matchup. Uh, Mackenzie Gore, if I'm going to play anybody, it's going to be him uh, in this game from on the mound. That is, he's got strikeout upside and this is a horrible matchup for him too. So I'll probably minimize my exposure there. Um, I'm kind of concerned with upside in general in this matchup against St. Louis. So I'd like to get to a couple of Cardinal stacks if I can, because he's got some hard contact concerns here. Does Gore, um, But I think he's very much in play. A really interesting tournament game there. Colorado-Cincinnati. I think a couple of these Rockies pieces are definitely in play. I'm I'm certainly going to have some McMahon and some um, Nolan Jones from the left side. I think Ben Lively might be in play here because they're still going to go pretty right-handed heavy. And overall, they're a bad creation offense. Um, Maybe like a three-man, Elias Diaz, Ryan McMahon, Nolan Jones, something like that is a playable stack. I don't it's going to be hard to convince me that full five-man Colorado stacks are in play. Full five-man Colorado or Cincinnati stacks are, are certainly in play against No Davis. Um, he pitches to a lot of contact, and this is a really dangerous offense over here with all of their lefties back healthy, Joey Votto, Jake Fraley in particular. Oakland, Cleveland, I think you play Oakland. If I had to pick a, a full stack in this game, it, it'd be Oakland, probably the top five, top six guys. Um, Cleveland on the other side, yeah, definitely, because they're mega cheap. Probably going to stay off pitching for the most part here. Um, Aaron Savali's in play, though. Have a little bit of coverage because Oakland's bad. I think that's a pretty good idea. Boston, Minnesota, Cutter Crawford. I think he's playable, 5,400. As is Bailey Ober, not so much at 92. Um, 
Bailey Ober's got strikeout upside against right-handed heavy lineups, but Boston's probably going to be pretty platoon heavy here tonight. Kind of a dangerous spot because he gives up so much contact to the right side. I'll probably just, just just stay off of this and rather just play Kirby uh, against the Yankees, I think, at similar ownership figures, to be honest. Um, Minnesota pieces, yeah, I want to get to a couple of stacks here if I can make it happen. Full stacks are very much in play, including some of the righties because of the very low strikeout rate for Crawford against right-handers, but mostly lefties because he gives up power to them. Texas and the White Sox, mostly Texas here for me, including Eovaldi. He's my preferred pivot um, if I'm getting up and ownership considered off of Garrett Cole, even though, you know, we'll talk about Kershaw. Uh, Dylan Cease, I'm not doing it, and I'm not doing any of the White Sox here, so Texas almost exclusively for me. Arizona-Milwaukee, really cool offensive tournament game here, I think. Um, I think both Arizona and Milwaukee get to be kind of off the board. And I think they're very, very high upside for both of these guys. Is Colin Ray in play? Yeah, price tag maybe, but not in this particular matchup. Super difficult spot going after Arizona here. Everybody in play, top to bottom, I believe. Mets Houston, I'm going to go after the Mets starter once again in Verlander. However, I'm probably going to have a little bit of coverage still because the swing strike stuff is just not there. And this is a bad matchup for that short porch in left field in the Crawford boxes. Um, at 300 down the line or whatever it is. Framber, sure, you could play him. I prefer getting to him a little bit as well to all the ownership of Garrett Cole, uh, even against the Mets. But some Mets pieces here from the right side, certainly playable due to the bad changeup from Framber, uh, Framber Valdez. San Diego, San Francisco, offense here a little bit too. Little pitching, I think. Seth Lugo, no thank you. Um, without a rehab start, I'm not interested. And Disco, uh, he didn't strike anybody out. And... I'm not really interested in that uh, going against, um, a, you know, an offense over here in San Diego that's kind of heating up. Dodgers and the Angels, mostly just the Dodgers and Kershaw here for me. I'm going to go after Reed Detmers again, but maybe I'll land on a piece here or there because I just I don't get it. And <laughs> uh, it's a fine price tag. So um, that's pretty much it for the breakdown. Once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as always. And good luck to everybody here on this Tuesday 11.